Be seated, please. I, th I think the Lord would say, it's good when my people sing to me. That's what you've been doing. This is our fifth and our final Sunday in our foundation series, which, if you've been around, it's all about our renewed and our refreshed statement of mission that is our purpose as a church and also our stated values. You recall that a statement of mission answers the what question. What is it that we do here? What are we about? And our answer has been, and let's say it together as it's on the screen, together, joining Jesus to trans restore and transform one another and our world. I've got it down after five weeks. <laughs> I think I need to say it again. Join me. Joining Jesus to restore and transform one another and our world. Amen. And then a set of values answers the why and the who question. Why do we do what we do? Who are we as we go about doing what we do? Values color everything that we think we say we do. Our, our values are aspirational, they're actual, they're somewhere in between and we're leaning into them, we're living into them more and more each week. Let's say our values together as they're on the screen. Ready? He, prayer humility, the grace and truth of Jesus, and courage. In the last three weeks, we have covered prayer, humility, the grace and truth of Jesus, what they look like as we go about our, our mission. And this morning, we're diving into courage, our final value. Elder Paul Zukunft is going to lead the way this morning as we reflect on courage, followed by a word from Elder Leona Larkin. Before Paul comes up, let me pray for us. Father, Open up our hearts. You've been, you've been prepping the beach of our hearts with all of the singing and the praying and the reflecting already. Now just pour it on, pour into us, and speak to us about courage through your servant, Paul, and through your servant, Leona. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please come forward, Paul. Good morning to all those in the sanctuary here today and to those of you joining us online. Uh, before we delve into this topic of courage, what an appropriate lead-in on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Uh, if that does not emote uh, images of courage, um, I don't know what else is. And you belting that out courageously really stirs my heart as well. So yes, today we close out our message series that has focused upon our mission and the four values that define who we are in fulfilling that mission. And we all know what that mission is, joining Jesus to restore and transform one another and our world. Our four values define each and every one of us. That is prayer, humility, the truth and grace of Jesus. And today, we will focus upon courage. How might you envision courage when it comes, first and foremost, to joining Jesus? After all, the phrase, do not fear, it appears 365 times in Scripture, one each day. So it's only fitting that today and every day, we focus upon not our fears, but on courage. It is courage that undergirds our faith in joining Jesus, and there is an introduction and also a launching pad that both occurred in Galilee over 2,000 years ago. And I'll read from Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. The sons of thunder, John and James, who were also fishermen, immediately followed as well. So ask yourself, if you are at your workplace, let's say tomorrow, and you're working on a spreadsheet, and a complete stranger comes up to you and says, I want you to log out. 
and I want you to spread the gospel to all nations. How would you respond to that? Well, if it was me, I'd say, can't you see I'm, I'm really busy. I have a deadline to meet. Or I might say, I have bills to pay, a family support. I, I can't join you right now. Or working in a secure environment, I would say, can someone run a background check on this guy? But just think about that. And what if this was truly the Messiah that shows up in your workplace? Would I have the courage to commit knowing this might not turn out so well as it did for those 12 disciples? You know, I believe Jesus already knew the answer to that question because to a person, they all joined Jesus. Later on, and again in Galilee, there's what you, what you might call mission impossible, or as we know, the Great Commission after Jesus' resurrection. And I'll read from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As we all know, these disciples would suffer every hardship imaginable and persecution. And these were 11 ordinary men. There were fishermen, a tax collector, a zealot, and a carpenter. And boy, did they pay it forward. It bogs the mind to think from these 11 disciples, there are 2.6 billion followers of the Christian faith today. That is real courage. And so, when you think about that, how might you demonstrate courage? Might you invite somebody into a spiritual relationship with just one acquaintance? Real courage. And think if we did that, we could have 5.2 billion followers among all nations following Jesus today. Now, today we live, I wouldn't say just in a very secular society, but we also live in a very polarized society. And there's a tendency to compartmentalize our faith with reluctance to invite others into the spiritual relationship with Jesus. This is what we call discipleship. And if you think about it, the numbers speak for themselves. In the 1990s, nearly 90% of this nation affiliated themselves with the Christian faith. Today, that number is a mere 68%, and it's trending downward. In fact, about 30% of our population have no religious affiliation whatsoever. So what's it going to take to join Jesus? Do we just sit and watch? Do we watch the numbers plummet? Or do we step up to the plate? And we do so with faith. And sometimes that faith may torment us. And I'm going to go off script because there are two people in our sanctuary today, Jim and Carol Hickerson, who kept the faith. Jim and Carol. As you know, Jim was a POW at the Hanoi Hilton and, like those disciples, suffered every hardship imaginable. But with great humility, he will never tell you that story. But what he did do is he kept the faith. Not only did he keep the faith, but every one of our U.S. prisoners at the Hanoi Hilton kept the faith. And I'm sure Jesus smiled upon these men. And it was a difficult homecoming for them. Many of them, their families had moved on, but they too kept the faith. And then Jim met this amazing woman named Carol who had lost her husband during the Vietnam conflict. They were joined together. 
they kept the faith. Not only did they keep the faith, but they are such an inspiration for us to be disciples of the faith today. Now, when it comes to joining Jesus, how else might that look here at First Prez? Well, stick around. After our 10 a.m. service, we're going to look at Chris Pan being ordained in the Blue Presbytery here at First Prez this morning. Now, as many of you know, Chris left a very lucrative career in the legal profession to become our executive director. Not only that, but he then went on to become ordained and gain the credentials to be a minister in the Presbytery minister. But really what strikes me more about Chris is his full transparency and courage when he is here at the podium. We've heard everything from compression socks, but I think more importantly, Chris has been very transparent with the vulnerabilities that he shares in his life. And that takes real courage. It takes real courage to be transparent, but in doing so, it makes Chris relatable. Maybe we're going through those very same vulnerabilities and challenges in our life, but when one person steps up and demonstrates that courage, we want to follow that person as well. Not only do we want to follow that person, but we also want to share our story as well. And now I'll admit, you know, I'm a, a great speaker of words, but not always the best follower through when it comes to deeds. Um, some of you may know I spent 45 years in the military. Uh, and as I was rising through the ranks, I would say I was pretty self-confident. Well, self-confidence has an evil sister, and it's called arrogance. Um, and that's what I was becoming. I was becoming the exact same thing I detested as I was rising through the ranks. Very rarely could I open up a sentence without the words I or me. It was all about me. Well, when it was time for me to leave the service in 2018, it was time for me to cast down my net just as Simon Peter and Andrew had done when they had first encountered Jesus. So I now spend the majority of my time doing nonprofit. Some of my colleagues say, whatever you do, do everything for money. I said, no, I'm going to do it by joining Jesus as an elder at this church and with our nonprofit enterprises that my wife Fran and I devote much of our free time to doing as part of joining Jesus. Now, there's another element of courage that perhaps is best reflected in the words of an Anglo-Irish Anglo statesman and philosopher, Edmund Burke. Here's old Edmund. Yeah, uh, Edmund Burke, uh, he wrote these words in the 1700s saying, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men, and I would add women, to do nothing. These words were published in the 1700s while the Catholic Church was under persecution and slavery had run rampant. Edmund Burke could not have been more visionary when you look at the works of our mission partners and two of them in particular. I would like to highlight Don and Bridget Brewster. Many of you may be acquainted with them and many of you may have participated in missions uh, to Swaypak with Agape International Mission. This past January, my wife Fran and I joined a group from First Pres led by our pastor Timo to support the Agape International Mission in Cambodia that was co-founded by Don and Bridget in 2006, and they currently reside on the North Shore of Oahu. If you were to Google child sex trafficking in 2006, and sadly many did, the village of Swaypak on the outskirts of Phnom Penh would literally jump off the charts. It was the ground zero, the epicenter of child sex trafficking facilitated by underground tour companies that enticed men and many of them from the United States to exploit God's children. Through the courage and commitment of Don and Bridget, Evil no longer 
thrives in Swaypak. What had been a sprawling brothel is now a place of worship for over 800 people in a country where over three, only 3% 3 of them identify themselves as Christian. It's also a garment factory for women who had been trafficked. In fact, when you look at our hymn conference t-shirts, when you look at Vacation Bible School, those t-shirts have a little tag on them. It said, this garment was made by women who were exploited by sex trafficking. It's that same garment factory in Swaypak. There's also a Lord's Gym at Swaypak. You say, what's a Lord's Gym? Well, this is a gym that, that restores and transforms mostly young men, not just in body, but in soul as well, and it takes them on a path away from evil. And there's also a SWAT team there that now go after these very sophisticated underground trafficking organizations uh, and rescue, restore, and transform young women. Yes, the only thing necessary for evil to thrive is for a few good men and women to do nothing. So let's hear it for Don and Bridget. I want to close on one final aspect as it relates to courage. Uh, some of you may be familiar with a book. It came out in 1956 titled Profiles and Courage by John F. Kennedy. And if you hadn't read the book recently, you might think it's about conquests, about Bunker Hill, uh, about Iwo Jima. No, it's not about any of that. It's about eight senators who had the moral integrity to turn their back on popular opinion within their political party and their constituents and do what is right. It was written in 1956, but I think it's just as relevant in 2024 when it comes to moral courage. Moral courage that divides this country. But yet when you look at all that divides us, all that polarizes us, what is it that joins us? It's all about joining Jesus. We're all made in the image of God. Why would it be so div divisive when God made us in his image? Profiles and courage. But I think more recently, many of you may have had that bracelet, that rubberized bracelet, WWJD. What would Jesus do? And if you wore that, you might ask yourself as you're driving through traffic, you're in a meeting, whatever, it's that subtle reminder of whenever maybe you're thinking of not doing the right thing, you say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. What would Jesus do? And when it comes to what would Jesus do, you really have two choices. You could be a bystander or what I will call being an upstander. Yes, an upstander. So let's put this to a litmus test. Say you're at a workplace, and, and maybe there's some fraudulent bookkeeping taking place. You say, well, I'm not the bookkeeper. I, I just work here. Or what if there are inappropriate remarks made based on gender, racism, religious beliefs? You say, well, okay, well, they're not saying it to me, so I'm not going to do anything about it. What if there's toxic leadership in the workplace. Say, well, I'm just gonna have to suffer through it. And everyone else suffers as well. Is that what Jesus would do? Is that what we would do here at First Pres? And just be bystanders? No, no, not even possible. So you think back to those 365 times where do not fear appears in Scripture. Is there anything holding you back today where you feel lacking in the courage to join Jesus, to be restored, to be transformed? And so I leave you with this message from Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, 
for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you with my righteous right hand. So, who are we? What are we about? We're all about joining Jesus to restore and transform one another in our world. And who are we? We are people who pray. We are people who are humble. We are people who uphold the truth and grace of Jesus. And we are upstanders of courage. Yes, courage in all that we do. Not just here today, but for the six days and 23 other hours of the week when we join Jesus in our daily walk. Now, at this point, I would like to call up to the lectern another one of our elders, Leona Larkin, who will share her testimony with you. Leona. Good morning. Good morning, First Prayers. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for those very, very beautiful words. And um, I'm going to go. So Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. In this moment... God is encouraging Joshua as he prepares to lead the Israelites across the Jordan into the Promised Land. If you remember, he and Caleb were only two out of 12 spies who were sent ahead to see into the land and report back to the rest of the nation. They had seen an abundance of provision and the giants who lived there as well. Joshua and Caleb believed that they could easily overcome the giants who lived there while everybody else disagreed. That fear infected the Israelites and they were forced to wander the desert for 40 years until that unbelieving generation perished and now that time had finally come for them to claim their inheritance. As we get ready to embark on our mission with Jesus, I wonder what it was about Caleb and Joshua that made it easy for them to believe that defeating those giants was possible. It's easy to say faith in God but what does that mean exactly? As a church, we believe in God and that Jesus is our savior. So why is it that some of us struggle to surrender our will or to trust him when he makes a promise that seems too impossible to be true? Wouldn't it be great if we were those people that when God said jump, we didn't even hesitate, we were already midair? I've been asking myself some of the questions for the past six months as I've found myself embroiled in what I can only describe as a sea of chaos. I've come to learn that the best way out of these tumultuous situations is through them. But right now, the thought of that seems completely gut-wrenching. Normally, I don't mind a bit of chaos because a little adventure never hurt anybody. Um, I generally roll with it, knowing that God is with me and things will turn out the way that they should but I've really been struggling to figure out what it is about this particular moment that makes it very difficult. So something amazing happened last week, okay? I was reading the second chapter of Life's Healing Choices, which is about letting go of our need to exert control over situations that are uncontrollable. Jim Baker states that when we understand God's true character, we, can comp we can't, when we don't understand God's true character, we can't completely trust him. And if we can't trust him, we can't surrender. So I paused to pray, and I asked, Lord, what am I not understanding about you? Why have I been having such a hard time lately? I waited, and King David came to mind, a warrior who spent a majority of his life fighting battles, and he only stopped because of old age. I then said to God, I don't understand how David was able to fight without getting tired I've been through this for a few months, and I am exhausted. Our loving father then said to me, clear as day, your problem is that you don't trust me. So I was surprised by this because 
Anybody who knows me knows that he's carried me through my divorce. He's carried me through my mother's cancer diagnoses. Um, I used to have a little corner on my board at work that had all the amazing things that he had done for me. So, what? He then proceeded to explain that I'm scared that he's going to forget about me, that I'm worried that when the chips are down, he'll be nowhere to be found and I'll be left to fend for myself. He then gently pointed out that he and I are not the same. As he explained it, he is much bigger than me. In fact, he doesn't get tired, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't eat, he doesn't do any of the things that I do. He told me that I am always firmly in his hand and I always will be. So my next thought was, well, you say that, but before I could continue, he told me to get up and retrieve this rock. This beauty behind me was given to me at work by one of our lovely volunteer chaplains about a month ago, and she told me to keep it with me for as long as I needed it and to pass it on to somebody who needed a little reassurance. I pulled it out of my purse, I sat down, and he told me to hold on to this rock for a week. I was like, okay, Lord. I was excited. I went to bed. I did my best to make sure that I was holding on to this rock uh, the next morning when I woke up. So the next morning I wake up and proceed to go about my morning routine, <laughs> and then it dawns on me that I don't have this rock. So I rush back to my bedroom, I you know, shuffle the sheets, and there it is in the middle of the bed. Now, I don't know how that happened because I have literally bragged to people that I sleep <clears throat> like a rock. I was humble that morning. I don't think even eight hours had gone by. God gracefully pointed out that in failing to trust him to have my back, I wrongly believed that I had to fight this battle by myself. So inevitably, I stopped focusing on what he was telling me to do and instead focused on saving my own life. He helped me understand that this situation was gonna expose some of the wounds from my marriage that still need attending to. As I shared with a friend, I'm currently being unraveled so he can ravel me correctly. The difference then between me and David was that David trusted God with his life and I was in a situation where I couldn't. Joshua and Caleb did, tip, did too. Their courage came from knowing that God would be there with them and that he would deliver on his promises. They knew that in walking with God, victory was guaranteed. As we move forward as a church into our new territory, let's be like Caleb, Joshua, and David. Let our courage lie in the truth that God is much bigger than us. He most certainly does not lose track of things and his plans are foolproof. Let's move forward knowing that as we join Jesus in this amazing mission to restore and transform one another in our world, that he holds us firmly in his hand and he will never let us go. Thank you. Oh, that's right. We've got elders who can preach. Thank you both. That was just awesome. It's been such a strong month as we focused on joining Jesus to restore and transform one another in our world. And as we join him, we join him with prayer, humility, the grace and truth of Jesus, and courage, as we were reminded this morning. So this entire month, we've been beating this drum and from now on, we will be beating this drum to remind ourselves, number one. Number two, to keep us from drifting off into what is not our mission. That is often called mission drift. We're not going to do that at this church. And also to introduce ourselves to our visitors so they really know what we're about on a regular basis. Let me offer a prayer now, and let's all join in prayer, a prayer of dedication and consecration to this statement of mission and to these values as we wrap up the month and head off into our future week by week. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we so need you. As Paul and Leona made super clear, none of this happens without courage. 
That's the word we've chosen, which is essentially faith. Faith that's active, faith that steps out into unknown territory, faith that is not so concerned about self, but is concerned about others and concerned about you. Help us to get this statement of mission and these values so inside of us that they are second nature. Walk with us as we join your son, Father, in what he's doing in us, between us, around us, and not just on this island, these group of islands, but anywhere in the world that you take us. We commit ourselves to these things. And Lord, just make them true, make them real, make them powerful in us. And we pray this together. And all God's children said, amen. All right, let's stand together and sing.